Good afternoon. How is everybody? Good, good. It's good to see this good crowd we have tonight. Y'all ready for tonight? Okay, all right. Well, I want to say um, that we've been blessed all week. It's been a great week. Uh, each night has just been a blessing, and we're expecting big things again tonight. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you um, came out tonight instead of something else, and, and you're in for a treat. All right? So uh, we've had, we've had Poovies, we've had Clover, we've had our very own quartet, and tonight we have our very own choir. <laughs> so blessed, blessed, yes, yet again. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for blessing us so very much. Lord, I thank you for the great number that's here tonight. I thank you uh, for your word and that we're going to hear a great word tonight. I thank you for being with our uh, Reverend Danny tonight. I pray that you would just bless him. Give him the very words that, that we need to hear. Give us the ears that we need to hear and, and listen and be changed. And God, we're just going to give you praise because you so, you're so worthy, so worthy. We love you, and we praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All
Let's all turn to 107. <clears throat> Excuse me. Love lifted me. Let's all stand and sing.
Good evening. It's good to see you. Revival's been good. I hope it goes on and on. Amen. Good singing. Good preaching. And thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Danny, make your way on up here. Some of you, if you've not heard Danny, I'll remind you, he is from Hudson, Cagers Mountain, pastor in the Good Church South Albemarle. Uh, again, a wonderful church. Danny does a good job. You already know that. Again, uh, he has blessed your heart. Let's make him feel welcome again tonight. Richard walked in, Richard Wynn, and said, see if Sam will let me introduce you. And I said, nope, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, we got some stories for sure. Uh, Sam lived on the good side of town. We lived on the bad side of town, uh, county. And uh, but anyhow, appreciate all of you being here. Man, it's been a good week. Amen. Amen. And uh, you guys listened well, and God's been here. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I need to encourage him just as much as you do. And uh, it's just a great honor and privilege, Sam, for you having me here. And uh, it's uh, just been a privilege. And I thank you for your faithfulness and all those who've prepared food. And man, it's been awesome. And uh, I just don't really eat much before I preach. It's just hard to do that. But uh, it's all been good. And uh, But anyhow, I'll make up for it when I get home, all right? So, uh, but you guys, what I did eat was excellent. And uh, thank you so much. And it's uh, uh, been a good week. And uh, God's presence has been here. And I'll be honest with you, I, I got another meeting next week. And you, you can't say that about everywhere, I promise you. And uh, Sam knows what I'm talking about. There's some places it's tight. Uh, there's just not liberty, but uh, you can tell that you folks love one another, and you you want to hear the word. And uh, folks, that's the only thing going to bring word. It's not going to be entertainment. It's going to be exhortation of God's word that draws us back to God. And uh, but anyhow, uh, I I spoke a little bit about worship and uh, and uh, obedience uh, out of uh, Abraham's experience with God as he offered up Isaac. Uh, I want to say uh, that there's a close link not only between worship and obedience. But between worship and works, we don't work to be saved, but we work because we are saved. And I think James clearly teaches that in his writings. So if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to be in the Old Testament book of Joshua, in the last chapter, chapter 24. We're going to read, if we may, begin in verse 13. 
uh, as he closes out in his uh, uh, final address to the children of Israel as he's approaching death. Uh, and he makes some interesting statements here. And uh, there's a key statement in this text that uh, he mentions. And he says, after all, all the good he has done. And uh, God's done some good things this week, amen. Uh, he wants to continue on uh, doing some good things if we allow him to in our lives individually and collectively. Uh, you know, I, I thought about that statement before I read the scripture, though. Uh, Sam, m many of you may know Gene Ridley down from the Wilmington area. And, uh, you know, all of us can do a little something. And uh, because we're saved, we, we ought to worship, and our worship ought to lead to works. And, uh, he was on a cruise, uh, Gene really was one time, and he uh, kept watching this elderly gentleman and said he would walk all over the cruise ship just like this. He said he kept walking, and he, he, got to walk, and he walked back and forth, and every day he seen him just walking, all he could do to walk. He said, what is that dude doing? He, he's too old to be on this cruise ship. And uh, he watched him a little closer and said he got a, a view of him, and he was walking, and he was handing out gospel tracts all over that cruise ship. And he said, boy, that burned my heart. And he said, he has every right and every reason to be on this cruise ship. He was sharing the gospel. And uh, if you've never heard him tell that, I don't know if Sam's heard him tell that or not. But listen, he had been gloriously saved later in life. And he was handing out those gospel tracts, working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, all of us can do something for the Lord Jesus. Well, we begin reading in this last chapter in verse 13. Uh, the scripture says, And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, and you dwell in them of the vineyards and olive, your, olive yards which you planted not do you eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity, in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He it is that brought us up out of our fathers, up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for He is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, you, you cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Your witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Notice he didn't say your ears. He said your heart. And the people said unto Joshua, the Lord our God will we serve and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God uh, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak. And there was the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us, and it shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man in, unto his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the, in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders the outlive Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Pray with me. Father, again, I thank you for this week you've given us. You've afforded us to be healthy and able to come, Lord, and to worship you. 
We thank you, Lord, for the moving of the Spirit of God and the invitations this week. And, Lord, we expect nothing less tonight, Father, than you to move in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray, Lord, I, I've, I've struggled, Lord, what, what direction to go tonight. And I just want to be obedient with where you've led me tonight. And, Lord, I pray it's not about me or what I can do, but it's what you can do in and through me. And I make myself available to you tonight, Father. I pray you'd overshadow me, Lord, to take the thoughts that I put down here. And, Lord, I may I express them in a fashion, in a manner, uh, Lord, that you would challenge our hearts individually. You would challenge our hearts and lives collectively tonight, God, that we might come uh, to, to the, bo the throne of grace boldly tonight, Father. Lord, I pray right now that I would uh, decrease, that you might increase. I pray, the Lord, that you would anoint me and, and give me that, the wisdom that I need to declare what you're saying in this scripture. And may we make the application we need to make tonight properly when it comes invitation time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, after all, the good God has done. If you'll see, that phrase is found in verse 20. He says, if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, he will turn, then he will turn and do you hurt. He's talking about chastisement here. Uh, and consume you after that he hath done you good. I don't know about you, but God's been good to me. Amen. He's been good to you. He's been good to the church I pastor. He's been good to this church. He's been good to me. But there's never been a more victorious leader, I think, in the scripture than that of Joshua. Joshua was a militant man. He was a mighty man of God. He had boldness. Uh, you had to be... Uh, 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 somewhat of a man to follow his successor, uh, that of uh, uh, Moses. What a great, renowned man of God he was, revered by the children of Israel. And here he comes, and he's got to fill his boots, so to speak. Can you imagine what it was like following the leadership of Moses? It'd be almost like somebody following the leadership of Sam Craven. Amen. Uh, Billy Graham, David Jeremiah, whoever it may be. But anyhow, I'm sure it wasn't easy. Uh, but we see that he's taking on a uh, somewhat for a while a, 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 a newer generation. Uh, many of those folks have died off in the wilderness because they griped and complained and they literally wandered in the wilderness under leadership of Moses for, for 40 years because they're grumbling, they're complaining, and they're murmuring after everything God done for them. They become dissatisfied. And that younger generation saw many of them uh, go to funeral after funeral. And I imagine Joshua did a lot of those himself. But we find that in this last part of the scripture here of Joshua, in Joshua's last address, he reminds Israel of all the things God had done for them. His past protection, uh, his past provision had been obvious. If you read the whole chapter, you'll notice at least 17 times up until verse 13. I read verse 13 tonight, but in the first 13 verses of that chapter, you'll find that the pronoun I is mentioned specifically 17 times. There were some things that Joshua hadn't done. There's some things that Moses did not do, but there were some things that God did and only God could do. And let me just say there's still some things only God God can do tonight in our lives, your life and my life as a believer in Jesus Christ. There's some things God had done. The, uh, the pronoun I was specifying that there's some things that he had already done for them. And they need to pay close attention to that. And just like the day in which you and I live, so many people uh, aren't living in victory today. So many Christians out there living in defeat and discouragement. Let me just remind you folks, listen, uh, so many people tonight uh, in this culture, in our world today, in the church age we're in, there, many are infected by self. Many are insulted by society. I'm talking about believers. We've been infected by self. Uh, we've been insulted by society. And we've been infiltrated by Satan. Uh, and those three points are very, very uh, crucial as you understand this scripture. Joshua's purpose in, in this closing address, he knows he's dying. And he wants to leave them a last word. It's like his uh, last words to the people of God. Uh, he wanted to remind them if they were to live victorious lives, they would have to maintain, I believe, four things. And those four things are found right here in the heart of this scripture. After all that he had done, ladies and gentlemen, they must live in careful reverence. Look at verse 14. They must live in careful reverence. First of all, I want you to notice in verse 14, in the very first part, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity. Notice that first part of that verse. It says, Now therefore for fear the Lord, realizing everything he's done for you, realizing everything he had done for them, uh, Joshua comes and he says, I want you to be sure you live in careful reverence. Uh, there's a warning here, ladies and gentlemen, against complacency. 
You see, sometimes we're not careful what happens after revival. We hear the preaching and the singing and we get, we get on this spiritual high. And if we're not careful, here comes a spirit of complacency right after that. And it happens so many times. We've got to continue to let the revival fires burn. We've got to continue to, with the flow of what God's doing. But notice what he says in this text. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. The word fear here means to maintain that reverential awe and that respect for who God is in your life and who He is in the body of Christ. That word fear, to fear means to have a wonder of and a wonder for. Folks, as I think about that, I think about Isaiah chapter 6 as I think about what Joshua was saying. That's exactly what had happened when Isaiah went into the temple that day. Now listen, he had just pronounced those six woes in the fifth chapter. As I already mentioned that one time this week. Uh, but he goes in there. Uh, he sees all around him. Listen, there's debauchery. There's drunkenness. There's all types of things that people define God. And he walks in. He's brought forth those warnings. And it's almost like he's overcome. He's defeated. And he hasn't seen any revolts, uh, results. And he comes there. And then all of heaven shows up. All of glory comes down. And he experiences those angelic beings there as they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And we understand that as we think about this warning against complacency, he's reminding him that there are some holy things, there are some great and wonderful things that God has done for them that they cannot forget. I'm reminded, I heard about the Gypsy Smith. Uh, Gypsy Smith was saved at age 17 uh, when he began to preach. He died at 87. And uh, his biography says that he was still, listen, he was still full of vigor. He was still full of life. And he was still full of excitement for Jesus Christ. Uh, somebody asked him what his secret was to such a victorious life. And I quote, he said, from the day Jesus saved me, I never lost the wonder. <laughs> uh, let me just say, we got to be very careful that we don't lose the wonder. And as we get older, sometimes that happens. We, 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 we tend to lose the wonder when old Uncle Arthritis shows up and Aunt Ru Rheumatism, and we can go on and on. And some of you younger folks don't even know what I'm talking about. Uh, but you're going to, I never did think I, my grandma would say, honey, oh, my arthritis, my old rheumatism showed up. I said, what in the world is she talking about? And, and now I know everything about what she's talking about. Uh, and some of those things you see her rub on her, I got them in my closet, I'm in my uh, medicine cabinet, amen. And, uh, but anyhow, some of you can say amen right there, all right? I've never lost the wonder. You know, I look around today and uh, I see so many people today in the church. We've lost the wonder of what God's done for us when it comes to salvation. We've got to be very careful. And when a revival reminds us of the wonder, the wonder of God, it reminds us of the wonderful things that happen. And folks, let me just say, in this revival, there's a warning here against complacency. And when we find ourselves complacent, that's when we've lost the wonder of what God's done for us. And we need to move back in an area of careful reverence for the things of God. Notice in this text, folks, if there's anything I want to challenge you tonight, listen, if there's any prayer that I have, I don't want to lose the wonder of what God's done in my heart and life. And I want to challenge you tonight, don't lose the wonder of what God's done in your heart and life this week. Don't lose the wonder of the night that, or day or wherever it is that you got saved. Listen, don't lose the wonder. I see so many people as they grow older and, and there's so many entanglements and things that bog us down. They, they lose the wonder. You see, every one of us uh, on the verge of something happening in our life, maybe physically, financially, emotionally, merely, that can, a root of bitterness can move in. And it, it'll, ruin our, it'll ruin our excitement, enthusiasm. And, and listen, Satan knows how to take our wonder away. And we've got to do everything we can to live in careful reverence. A warning against complacency. But there's also in verse 14 there, uh, listen, there's a warning there against carelessness. Look what he says. And serve him in sincerity and in truth. Uh, a warning against carelessness. Uh, he's already told them in verse 13. He reminds them. He says, uh, and I've given you a land for which you did not labor. Listen. And cities which you built not and you dwell in them. Of the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted not do you eat. He says, listen, you're flourishing. You didn't plant a bit of those vineyards. If you go to Israel, the, some of the most fertile ground. Listen, they, have, they plant crops two and three times a year there because the ground is so fertile. It's still one of the number, number one uh, 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 
produce, uh, producing countries in the world because the ground's so fertile and the seasons are just right for seasonal growth on several occasions. As soon as, that, listen, as soon as one crop comes out, they go through those fields and they plow it up and they're ready for another. Why? Because God's blessed that place and He's blessed that. And let me just say this. As you think, of, there's a warning here against carelessness. You see, their carelessness would come when they begin to credit themselves for their success. When they begin to give credit to themselves for their success, they were to never forget that it was God that had brought them to where they were. You see, carelessness will do th three things, and he's warning them of this, that in this text. Carelessness will cause you to forget his protection. Carelessness will cause you to forget his provision. Carelessness will cause you to forget his prosperity. I'm reminded there's a link here as you think about the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. They were known as the foolish church. Or they were known also as the, maybe the foolish church or the different titles for them, the careless church. But the Bible says in that verse, in chapter 3, it said that they were rich, they were increased with goods. And that would cause them to drift away from God and they needed to repent. But that little phrase increased with goods literally meant that, listen, it's a description there literally that things had overcome them. Things that were insignificant, things that were unimportant, things that really made no eternal difference had overcome them. Things become their life. And he said, and what happened? These things, these riches, these things, they were so increased with goods or things, the Bible says, that, that they had they felt like they had need of nothing. And they got to the point where they didn't even realize they needed Jesus. You know why? Because they lost the wonder. Listen, because they moved from, they begin to be complacent and they begin to be careless. Let me challenge you and I tonight. As we leave this meeting tonight and we go forward, let me challenge you tonight. Listen, God stirred some of your hearts toward him this week. Listen, you make sure you, you, don't, you do everything you can to safeguard yourself from becoming complacent with God. Be sure you do everything you can that you don't become careless in what God's entrusted you with. Be careful that you don't overlook what you've prayed about in this altar. Be careful that you don't become careless in what he's told you to do from this week forward. Don't be careless in what he's challenging you with. He may have spoken to some of you about joining the church. He may have spoken to some of you tonight later in this invitation about coming to Christ. Don't be careless and leave here without Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, we must live in careful reverence. That's what he was saying to them. Uh, but they know that need to also look with me in verse 14. He said, Now therefore serve the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Uh, no, that word serve is an interesting word. If you, I don't know if you picked up on something as I read that scripture, but did you notice I, I can highlight at least 12 different times that, that in his address, Joshua says, serve, 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 serve. 12 times he mentions serve from verse 14 all the way down to verse 31. He mentions the word serve. Why? Because sir, the word serve, listen, we can't be in a complete relationship and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ without finding a place to serve. Can I challenge you tonight, if you're a Christian and you belong to Union Grove Baptist Church, Find somewhere to serve. Amen. You can serve anywhere. You can serve in many ways. There's so many. You don't have to preach. You don't have to sing. Listen, some of my most effective workers, listen, are my senior adults. Senior adult women who volunteer uh, to work with Alzheimer's patients. Uh, single adult men, listen, that are retired and they have time on their hands. Listen, and I'll never forget the, one of the ladies that I pastored. Listen, she couldn't go anywhere. Uh, she couldn't do anything, but I knew she was a prayer warrior I knew she prayed for me but you know when she knew when my children's birthdays were and and every birthday here I go to the mailbox you could pretty much count on it uh, Miss Margaret Preston was her name uh, she was homebound uh, she would take a card and she would write something in that birthday card for my children listen and on the and she had taped quarters on the right side 
I mean, that thing was so heavy when you got it out of the, it probably cost her more to mail it uh, than she could just said, Preacher, come, I got something for you. It probably cost her more to mail that card than what the quarters were in it. But it would be, they would, she would tape those quarters. Listen, my kids have never forgotten that, and they're all in their 30s today. I've never forgotten that, and I've been going from there for years. But listen, there's all types of ways to serve. Make yourself available. That's what Joshua was saying in his final address. One of the reasons their forefathers, Listen, they, they, they got into the traps they did is because they grumbled and they complained. Listen, they griped about the manna. They griped about the uh, uh, um, cloud shading them. They, they just a little bit, they complained about the, the, the shoes God gave them in the desert. Just something all the time. Uh, that was their number one sin. And you look through the book of Exodus, mummer and complaining, mummer and complaining. You're never going to honor God doing that. Serve. That word serve. You look at that ser word serve. What does it mean to serve? It means to give homage to. It means, uh, here it is. Here it comes. It means to worship. You can't worship without serving, and you can't serve without worshiping. It means to give homage to. It means to worship. It means to love Him. It means to bow before with the heart. You know, <clears throat> we can't be a spectator and serve. Let me challenge you, after you leave this meeting this week, find a way to serve. You'll get more honor and privilege and satisfaction in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know you've got a thriving ministry down here. It's just taking off. Some of you are serving. I want to challenge you. You jump right in there and pack a bag and get in line and meet people. Let them know Jesus loves them. Amen. Amen. I'm challenging you tonight. There's so many ways around here with the volume of people you have to find a, a, a place to serve. But I want you to notice something in this thing of serve. There's a, again, there's a close link between worship and service. Notice he says, uh, first of all, in this service about our worship. Look at verse 14. Uh, he said that we're to serve him in sincerity. Uh, that word sincere is the root of the word sincerity. That word literally in the Hebrew, uh, it, it, the, the words in Hebrew and Greek paint a word picture. Uh, that word sincere, it means to be without blemish. Uh, the idea here is, is they would bring that animal to, to the tabernacle to offer a sacrifice. And the first thing would be done, listen, is the, uh, one of the Levites, they're working in the temple, they would go in and they would begin to examine that uh, animal, that lamb from the head all the way down to the toes, every bit of it. They would run their hands up its legs. They would run their hands and all over to make sure that it was a perfect sacrifice. All pointing to Jesus, matter of fact. But what they would do is they would use these animals for sacrifice and they must be whole and complete. That's why Jesus was worthy to be the, the perfect, complete sacrifice. There's also a word picture painted in this word sincere. Uh, what they would do is they would, uh, in the market of that day, they would make pottery. And many times what they would do in order to pass off a piece of pottery and sell it, maybe it got cracked or, or burned due to the heat in the process. What they would do is they would fill that pottery in with wax and they would polish it and then they would paint it and they, make it, and they would polish it so that underneath you couldn't see the underlying crack. And what they would do, and, and that's what he's speaking of here. Listen, uh, and those cracks will be filled with, with wax and, and polished and sold. And that's what he's saying. Our worship must be sincere. It can't be un unadulterated. It can't have cracks in it. We have to be solid. We have to be pure. And we have to serve Him. And our worship must be sincere. That's what He's saying to them. Uh, serve Him in sincerity. Don't do it just because you have to. He said do it because you want to. Do it in truth. Makes a big difference. You see, you're never going to get joy out of service if you're not doing it out of excitement, enthusiasm, and doing it for the Lord and not for yourself. Secondly, our worship must be scriptural. Look at the latter part of verse 14. He said, put away the strange gods of your fathers that they served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. It didn't take long for Israel to start serving strange gods. There's many of them. I'm going to mention them in just a moment. Our worship must be sincere. He's Our worship must be scriptural. Our worship must be steadfast. He says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. 
You see, every one of us have to make a choice of who we're going to serve. And God's not going to make us serve Him. He gives us a choice. He gives us a choice to serve Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't get us by the hair of the head and force us to worship Him and to serve Him. He's not going to force us to come to, to salvation. Listen, it's still by grace through faith. Listen, God gives us opportunity through the situations and circumstances of our life. He's working all around us continually trying to speak to us and draw us to Himself. Thank God for that. And he convicts us. But notice our worship must be scriptural. Uh, that little phrase right there, truth, is what we need to hone in on for just a moment. We're to, we're to choose to worship him. We choose him to worship him in truth when we serve him. Uh, Adrian Rogers said, if you worship the Lord in sincerity without truth, you'll be a fanatic. <laughs> if you worship him in truth without sincerity, you'll be a legalist. But if you worship and serve the Lord in scriptural worship, in truth, you'll be a Christian pleasing to Him. Wow, what a statement. Our worship must be sincere. Our worship must be scriptural there in verse 14. But as you read verse 15, uh, he says, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Don't put it off. The emphasis here is our worship must be steadfast. How, and he says, Choose you this day. Uh, he says, We've we got to put, off, put away some things. Uh, up in verse 23, he says, Put away those strange gods. Put away those things that have inclined your heart to turn toward them. Put away those things that have interrupted your relationship. Make a good choice for Jesus. Make a choice to the will of God. We have to make individual choices as to whom and how we'll serve. The third thing I want you to show you is he challenges them that they must live in continual repentance. Back in verse 14, here it is again. He's speaking of continual repentance there in verse 14 and the latter part. He sort of repeats himself all through this text. Why does he keep doing this? Well, here's why. Understand, they'd been out of Egypt for about 40 years. And here Joshua is still reminding them that the weeds of the old life have the ability to entangle them. That's what he's doing. Don't miss that. He's still reminding them that the weeds of the old life have the ability to entangle them. And can I say tonight, listen... That's why we need revival. That's why we need to be faithful to the house of God, to the things of God. Because, listen, the weeds of the old life have a way of creeping up and entangling us and pulling us away to the strange gods of this culture. You see, there's some things that have happened in their life. You see, they've been in, introduced to some gods, and the, really they're the same gods we battle, just a different name. They had been introduced to Mammon. Mammon was a, the, the Syrian god of deity. It was a god of wealth. We have that same god today, don't we? Man, I, I just heard this morning that the numbers, 230-something billion dollars has just been spent on people playing the lottery through online betting for sports betting. Can you imagine that? Wow. A Syrian god, a Syrian deity, deity named Mammon, the god of wealth. Then they serve Bacchus, Bacchus was the god of drunkenness and drugs and pleasure. I, I was telling somebody today, uh, I think at dinner, uh, where we live, shamefully, we have two ambulance, ambulatory uh, vehicles that run constantly, 24-7, constantly responding to Narcan to, to, for uh, ODs, delivering Narcan to people who overdose. One of the leading areas in the state of people who are OD on drugs the God of Bacchus, the God of drunkenness and drugs and pleasure. Then they serve the God of Aphrodite or Venus, the God of sexual lust and promiscuity. <laughs> wow. Then they serve the God of Mars. God, Mars was a God of war, hatred, blood, lust, and revenge. Folks, it's every day that you turn on your TV as you look around you today. And I'm not talk, trying to be doom and gloom. I'm just giving you reality, folks. Reality of why, where, why we need revival. Why our worship must be steadfast. Why we need to live in continual repentance. Because all around us there's so many things that, listen, so many things that can trap us. So many weeds that, that can entangle us. So many things that we have that can pull us away. It's just not like it was when we grew up. When we grew up, listen, we played in the woods all day long. We trusted our neighbors. Listen, mom and dad didn't have to worry about us. You, you didn't hardly meet a stranger. 
stranger. You didn't hear about the things that some of these young people and these children have to deal with today. Listen, we live in dangerous neighborhoods, communities, schools, all around us. The environment and culture of our day and the atmosphere has totally changed. Therefore, we need to raise our children to learn and to know God and how to walk with God because these gods are going to come after them and they will. The God of war, hatred, blood, lust. And then there was the God of Sophia. Sophia was the goddess of worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom. We don't need God. All we need to do is get a college degree and we can do without God. We'll be our own God. Uh, and the New Age movement is still vibrant today uh, in our universities. Then we have, the, they worship the God of Baal. Uh, Baal was, uh, uh, Baal worshipers really had four core beliefs. Sound, see if this sounds familiar or if we can relate that to our day. Uh, the, those who worship Baal, they were pro-choice. <laughs> they waited until the baby was born and they offered it on the altar to their God. They were environmentalists. It's okay to kill a baby, but not a tree or a ring-toed buzzard. Still prevalent today, huh? Homosexuality was at the core of their promiscuous lifestyles. Those who worshipped Baal were inclusive. They sought to have Baal worship and the worship of Jehovah to be incorporated. They said, well, your God's no different than our God. Uh, we, we can worship your God. Why can't you worship our God? There's no difference in Baal. There's no difference in Jehovah. After all, there's all one God. There's all many gods. Uh, listen, and they were polytheistic. Uh, listen, and God, listen, we, 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 we as God's people are monotheistic. We serve one God, the true, the living God. Your God and our God are the same. No, they're not. Allah and Jesus are not the same, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but here's what I'm saying. All these gods that we're looking at, that they were battling, they have resurfaced in our day. Only they have new names, but they really have old faces. And by the way, we've got these guys going around today. They're saying that we're all little gods. No, we're not. <laughs> we're sinners. We're heathen. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ and God sends His love and His grace and He convicts us of sin and He saves us and we'll never be God. We'll never reach the plateau of Him. He's holy. He's sovereign. He's righteous and we'll never be God. Amen. He is totally different. He is, he is the living and the true God. Amen. He's our Savior. We can't equal ourselves to Him. We don't have that capacity. Why? We are sinners who've been saved by grace. And then the last thing I want to mention, he says to them, is that they have to practice complete reliance. Look at verse 16 as you follow. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we for should sake the Lord and to serve other gods. Now it really sounds like they're going somewhere. It sounds like they're getting the message, all right? For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out of the, our, and our fathers out of the land of Egypt. Uh, from the house of bondage, which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelled in the land. Therefore, we will, will we also serve the Lord, for He is our God. There's no question, Joshua. Why are you preaching this, Joshua? There's no doubt. He, he's our God. Listen, we've seen what He did against the Amorites. We've seen how, what He's done to preserve us. We've seen Him, what He's done. It almost seems like they have complete reliance. But I want you to notice what they're doing here, ladies and gentlemen. They're making a quick commitment. But it has no depth. We've got to be very careful that we don't make a quick commitment in our response to God with no depth. There has to be roots in our decisions for Jesus Christ. A quick commitment. And he recognizes that. And look at verse 18. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people and the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore we will also serve the Lord for he's our God. But then in, in the midst of that, listen. Um, you know, as I think about the, this quick commitment they're making... We've got this new thing today going around, and it's called situational Christianity. Situational Christianity. It's, you, he, he's my God on Sunday, but I don't mention him anywhere else until I come back on Sunday. If I have a crisis, if I have a difficulty, 
uh, I'm not going to bother him. I'm not going to. He, he don't. He doesn't bother me, and I don't bother him. But if something does happen, and I need to call on him, I will. Folks, that's not the Christian life. That's just not biblical Christianity. And listen, there's situational Christianity is a situational relationship with God is what they were doing. A quick commitment, and Joshua recognizes it. Look at verse 19 and verse 20 because he comes back with a quick caution. And Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God and he's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, he will, listen, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that you have, after he's done you good. He says, after all he's done for you, after he's been so good to you, there's no way that you can treat him the way you're treating him. There's no way that you can make a quick commitment and not follow through with it. He's bringing a quick caution. Joshua knew these people were really just say listen uh, we want to get out a hell free card and that he knew their hearts and he knew that they were just responding to be responding and we got to be very careful that we don't do that Joshua said he said listen guy you're too confident you're too cocky you're too careless I don't really think you mean what you're saying he, he says listen I'm talking about real genuine service you need to serve him not like your mothers and your fathers did look what happened to them uh, they, they said one thing uh, they acted another way they murmured, they complained, they grumbled, they griped, and they went in a circle for 40 years because they couldn't go forward because they were rebellious toward God and toward Moses' leadership. Time and time and time again. And that's where they were where they were. And he wants them to understand the commitment they're making is serious. You see, you've got to be very careful making a quick commitment. You've got to be very careful. And there's a quick caution here. But I want you to notice there's a serious conclusion. Verse 21. And the people said to Joshua, verse 21, they said, Nay or no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, Your witnesses against yourselves, that you've chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away. He said, Let me see how real you are. You're going to witness against yourself. The evidence is going to speak for itself. Here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to put away the strange gods. You see, the strange gods are those little things I've just mentioned, those other gods that they still wanted to cling to, but yet they wanted to serve Jehovah. You see, those little gods, those things sometimes that maybe take the place of God. And by the way, anything that takes the place of God in your life is a little God. He wants to be on the throne of your heart and your life. He wants to be first. He don't want to be second best. He, he don't want to be something just on Sunday. He wants to be a vital part of your life every day. He wants you to have a vital relationship and fellowship with Him. A very serious conclusion that He gives here. He says, Now therefore put away, said He, the strange gods which are among you. And then look what He says. Don't put away the strange gods. He said, But incline... He doesn't say your ear, does he? He says, you see, because sometimes they were just like us as Baptists. You know what it does sometimes? It goes in one ear and guess what? It comes out the other. Jesus taught a parable about that. He said, you know what? You've got to be careful. He said, listen, it's like this. A sower goes out to sow seed, and he sows seed, and, and it falls on different soils, uh, hard ground, soft ground, thorny ground, wherever it falls. But what Satan does, and he gave a powerful illustration. He said, what Satan does, he's waiting for that seed, and he tries to intercept that seed, and he tries to get that seed before it falls on your heart. Because when it falls on your heart, you have to respond to it and make a decision for God's will and God's work for your life. A serious conclusion. Put away the strange gods which are among you and incline your heart unto the God of Israel. And look at verse 24. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice will we obey. And Joshua made a covenant. As you read down through the rest of the scripture, he established a stone there as a witness of what they had done. Concrete evidence. And verse 31 says, and listen, and Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Wow. You see, the story ended pretty good. But Joshua was very honest and was very upfront. He wanted them to understand. He said, okay, guys, 
I want you to understand this thing is serious business. I want you to understand you are witnesses against yourself as the, the commitment that you're making to Jehovah God. Therefore, he's going to hold you accountable. You ever thought about that? We come to church, we hear the preaching of the gospel, we hear what's being said. But sometimes we don't stop and absorb what he's saying. We're so busy, we're so fast-paced, we've got to be over here and got to be over there. Sometimes we get in a hurry. And you see, it's during revival so many times. God slows us down long enough so he could speak to our hearts. He allows the sower to come and sow the seed. And he, land, he causes it to land on our hearts. And then he expects us to obey. You know, the first thing, Josh said, the first thing you need to do, guys, the first thing you need to do to show your sincerity is to put away your strange gods and start listening to Jehovah God. You know what that sounded like to me? It sounds a whole lot like repentance, doesn't it? <laughs> Pretty good description. Got to ask a couple questions tonight as we close this meeting out. Revival goes on. The meeting may close tonight. But revival, generally, it goes on if we allow it to. Let me ask you tonight. Is your worship sincere? Is your worship sincere? Or are you just getting by? Do you need to find a place to serve? I'm speaking to believers tonight. Do you need to find a place to serve? You've been saved. Have you followed the believer's baptism? Have you joined the church? The reason we have the church is because the church is a body. And God has given every one of us individual gifts so that we can use those to, for the edifying of Christ. Uh, listen, not to promote ourselves, but to, to, to find our place to fit and join and to do the work of the ministry. The pastor can't do it all. The, 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 listen, the, the ministerial team can't do it all. God's given us assignments individually for you and I to do so that we can reach this community and this world for Jesus Christ. But we've got to our worship has to be sincere. If we're not careful, what happens is we get to the place where we get burnt out. We get to the place where we become careless. We get to the place, if we're not careful, just like we begin, just exactly like where they were, they become complacent. And complacency always leads to carelessness. And that's why we need revival every now and then. You know why? Because with all the things coming at us in our lives on a daily basis, Complacency slips in, and then carelessness slips in. And guess what? We tend to forget about his protection. We forget about his provision. We forget about his prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, Joshua's going to die. He knows he's going to die. He says, listen, guys, I'm leaving here, but I want you to remember some things. I want to, I want to remind you that you, you, you need to live in careful reverence. You got to live with courage, courage, resolve. You got to make some commitments right here, right now, and it can't be just talk. It there has to be action. Let me challenge you tonight. If you're here and you're a Christian, if you're here and you belong to the Union Grove Baptist Church, listen. You might be holding a position. You might be doing a job here. Maybe just attending faithfully, but you you sense some complacency. That excitement's just not there. You see, and I hear it all the time. Well, preacher, I've done my time. It's time for the younger generation to do that. I'm sorry, that's nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> that's the only problem. It's nowhere in Scripture. Look at some of the men of the, the ages of these men through Scripture and women. Listen, they didn't quit. Think about Gypsy Smith in, in his 80s. Listen, and, listen, and he was still going strong. He said, from the day Jesus saved me, I've never lost the wonder. Let me challenge you tonight. Get the wonder back. Amen? Thank God for what He's done for you. And share it with somebody else. Listen, spill over into their lives. Take one of these young folks under your arm. Take a young couple, listen, under your arm, you older couples, and nurture them and develop them. Take them to eat. Spend time with them. Help them and encourage them to, and show that them they're, they're important to the church and the body of Christ. So many ways tonight, as we close this meeting tonight, have you lost the wonder? Have you lost the wonder of your salvation?
Have you lost the wonder of God allowing you to hold that position? Have you lost the wonder of your service? Do you need that sincerity back? Maybe there's somebody, you, God's nudging your heart. You know you have a spiritual gift to do something, but you just aren't doing it. Maybe tonight you need to make the commitment at the end of this service to find that place to serve and commit yourself to serving Jesus Christ. Every one of us have areas in our life from time to time we'll find in which we become complacent, even the best of us. And usually that's when we need we can see the need of revival. And then I want to speak to those who have never accepted Jesus Christ tonight. The worst thing you can do is to keep putting off your salvation. Keep putting off the calling of God to salvation, no matter what age you are. The facts, the facts speak for themselves. After you reach the age of 50, the chances are decreased drastically of those who come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Two messages in that. If you're here tonight and you, you're not 100% fully assured that you're a Christian, that you're serving God out of the love and, and compassion of your heart, listen, you're not just working to be saved, but you're working because you are saved. You, if you need a commitment to Jesus Christ, you need to, you need to make sure tonight that you're saved. And then those of us tonight that are younger, we need to make sure that we seize those opportunities when God speaks to us. Not long ago, I ran across a guy, miserable, miserable. He gave preacher after preacher a fit. And I began to do a little investigation, and I found out what happened. He had ran preacher after preacher off. I began to talk to somebody in his family. He said, years ago, Brother Danny, he said God called him to preach. And he went to Fruitland, and he got mad at somebody up at Fruitland and left and went back home, and he, and he said, I'm quitting the ministry. And he carried that bitterness and that anger with him for years and years and years. And as far as I know, he was a, he was a preacher. His son, he had two sons that were preachers. He had a nephew that was a preacher. But he lived in bitter all his life. Bitterness. Because he failed to be obedient to what God called him to. He failed to serve in the capacity God had called him to. And I can tell you countless other stories. One of the dreadful, most dreadful experiences I think I saw was a gentleman who came to church for some time. And God's spirit was moving through the church. You could tell the Holy Spirit was moving. People were being saved. And I watched that dear man, probably in his late 70s. And honestly, I could literally see his hands on the back of the pew, and I could see the pew shaking. He was under so much conviction. And I stood and prayed the whole time, Oh, dear God, save him. God, help him walk that out. Help him make that decision. It's been over 30 years, and I stand here and still think about him walking out that church door. God had given him an opportunity to serve. And he said no. God had given him an opportunity to come to Jesus and serve him. And he said no. I don't know if he ever did or not. In likelihood he did. He was already in his late 70s. But he was under so much conviction. God was dealing with him. And he walked out that back door. And he said no. I, I saw it with my own eyes. I could tell. He was under such a weight and a burden as he gripped the back of that pew and his little granddaughter standing beside him and tears running down her cheek. You see, because she had been praying for him and he said no. Let's all stand tonight. I'm going to have our musicians to come. Our heads bowed nice closed tonight. Pray with me if you would. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand tonight on this meeting and preach and Lord, I know under the sound of my voice there may be somebody here that's never accepted Jesus Christ. Lord, they can't serve you in the free pardon of sin because they've never been born again. 
they have no desire to serve you, Lord, tonight because they've never accepted you. And I pray the Holy Spirit would prick their heart. I pray, Lord, tonight that they've heard now with their ears, but I pray now that they hear.